Welcome everybody to Atasca Water's Practical Water Wisdom Series Season 2. I'm Brian Whittemore, your host for today. We have a whole new lineup of speakers and topics this year. Some of them may even surprise and challenge what you know about the subject. Please stay online to the end of our program today to see if your name is drawn to win Dr. Peruk's, Peruk's new book, Loon Lessons. We'll be giving away six of the books and what will happen, that'll happen right after the Q&A part of our program. Atasca Waters is a nonprofit whose goal is to educate residents in Atasca County about how to keep our water clean for both the environment and the economy. We've been teaming up with like-minded people and organizations for 14 years now, and you can read about those projects on our website at atascawaters.org. If any of that is of interest to you, please consider becoming a member or a volunteer to help support programs like this. We thank our partners, shown right now on your screen, for their support in producing this program. Now here on screen is your guide for today's program. Dr. Peruk will speak for 30 minutes or so, and then we'll answer questions from you. To submit a question, you will need to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and type in a brief question. And you can do this at any time, and we'll read the questions on your behalf. This program is being recorded and will be available for viewing online through our website, ataskawaters.org. Finally, we really value your opinion. So please click on the survey line, which will be uh, the link rather, which will be on screen at the end of today's program or complete the survey that we will send to you via email. Our speaker this noon hour is Dr. James Peru, professor of biology at St. Joseph's College in Standish, Maine. Dr. Peruk is one of the world's leading experts on the common loon. He has studied breeding and wintering loons across North America for the past 30 years and has a new book out called Loon Lessons, Uncommon Encounters with the Great Northern Diver. Today, Jim will talk to us about the increasing interaction between loons and the bald eagle and what conservation measures might be undertaken, if any. So, loons and eagles. Wow, what a great topic to start our 2023 water wisdom season. And Dr. Peruk, the floor is all yours. Welcome. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, glad you're here. At lunchtime, we'll get through this. And I just want to give some real brief background on myself. So I moved to Maine in 2011. Um, and uh, the little background story is I go, I enter in, into a tennis tournament. Tennis is one of my passions. I enter this tournament. I go to some court here in Maine. I get introduced to, to my opponent. We shake hands. I start asking questions. Where are you from? I start talking about myself, my family, my kids, my wife, asking him about his questions. And then finally he says, you, you're not from around here, are you? And I say, he goes, no, 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 don't answer that question. He goes, I know where you're from. You must be from the Midwest. And that's, those are my humbled origins, very Midwest origins, and uh, very proud to wear a Midwest hat. Okay, so I was asked to talk about bald eagle and loon interactions. And really fascinating discussion. Glad you all joined. If I had my druthers, we would be in a large room. We would see each other. I would go around to all of you and say, what are your observations? What have you seen? And then couple that with what I've seen and what I know talking to other researchers and colleagues in the field. And we would have a wonderful discussion. So we're gonna do the best we can in a webinar series, having a discussion about eagle and loon interactions. And this is just to, to show you some of the places where I've done research. So I spent two field seasons up in Alaska, four field seasons in Washington, two field seasons in Nevada studying migrating loons, two in Southern California studying wintering loons, seven years in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Louisiana, seven winters in South America looking at wintering loons on a freshwater reservoir, six winters off the East Coast studying winter loons, and 12 seasons in the Midwest. So I spent three field seasons in Michigan, three field seasons in Wisconsin, and six field seasons in Minnesota. So altogether, you kind of get an idea of where I've been, the research I've done. And I feel it's been a great privilege 
to be able to study loons for as long as I have. I've met so many wonderful people. My life has been tremendously enriched, just great, great people, biologists, private citizens, and wonderful organizations that I've worked with. So the structure of the talk is just some real basic biology to make sure we're all on the same background in terms of eagles and loons. And then I'm going to go into some historical and current eagle-loon interactions. And then I'll offer my perspective. And that'll probably take most of the 30 minutes times that we have allotted. And then as John mentioned, we'll have time for questions afterwards. So we have to give the bald eagle credit for being a remarkable predator. It's, it's their living in terms of Geico, it's what you do. It's what they do, right? They, they hunt and predominantly they feed on fish. Most of that's caught themselves, but they will pirate fish from other, other animals in particular like osprey. So 60% of their diet, depending on where you are in North America is fish-based. 25% more or less bird-based will feed on waterfowl. Uh, they're becoming a little bit of a problem in the East Coast, feeding on seabirds, they're causing some problems. And of course, that's what kind of brings us to the loon topic as well. And then depending on where you are in North America, 15 or so percent might be mammals, such as hares and rabbits and things of that nature. So the strategy of the bald eagle is to be extremely observant in its environment. They're gonna find a great perching spot and they're gonna wait and they're gonna use their tremendous eyesight to just cue in on what's happening in their environment. And I, I feel fairly confidently that eagles like crows and gulls, they know what's going on in their environment. They know where every loon nest is. They know where, what they, they probably figure out the schedule, <clears throat> excuse me, when loons are off their nest, that they're hyper aware. But the one thing to mention is that they're opportunistic. So they're not a specialist feeding on just loons. They're, they're taking advantage of what's available in their environment. It might be spawning fish, for example, or it might be a flock of waterfowl. And where loons and eagles come together, of course, is eagles nest near lake shores, most water bodies, be it large rivers, for example, they nest high in trees, they nest uh, year after year, they produce a couple of eggs, they raise chicks. And where it comes into loons is eagles are one or two months ahead in the breeding season than loons are. So when the loons are hatched in July, those young in the nest of eagles are, you know, one or two months further along and, and you need more food. And I think that's some of the pressure that the adult eagles face on providing food for their young as they get older. So the interactions that what we've seen is eagles will predate on loon chicks. So generally they'll take them off the water surface or just snatch them and maybe row to shore. I saw my first attack of an eagle on a loon in 1999. It was, it was a loon, young chick. Uh, the eagle had perched for over an hour and just waiting patiently. And then eventually the one parent was off foraging, the other parent created some space between it and the chick. And before you know it, the eagle soared in and grabbed the chick. And the chick was less than two weeks old, so it was fairly small uh, and was taken by the eagle. We do know loons occasionally will attack incubating adults. I reported that first in 1997 when I observed a bald eagle again, flying in the territory of a loon, waiting patiently roughly an hour. And then when the loon looked away, the eagle swooped down right on top of the incubating loon and a great battle ensued. So the loon was trying to get off the nest. The eagle had part of the loon in its talons and there was a great thrashing about for about 20 to 25 seconds. And then the loon evaded the eagle and got into the deep water. And the eagle remained on the nest, but interestingly, it did not puncture the eggs. It did not eat any of the eggs. And eventually after a few minutes, it flew off. It took roughly an hour before the female loon got back on the nest, but at which time it called for its mate, its mate had come back and then they resumed nesting. 
And I mentioned oversight. So oversight is just killing of eggs, right? Predating, depredating eggs. And we see now that eagles are depredating some loon nests. And so the way they may do that is they may fly over the nest, irritate the incubating adult, the adult gets off the nest, and then the, loon, the, the, the eagles can feed then on the eggs. And that's been documented. How often that occurs, I'm not sure. Again, more data on this topic is valued. And that's why we're having this discussion here today. So most of us who are listening and viewing it are familiar with loons, and I really probably don't need to go into too much background on loons. You know, we love loons, and some of us in camp love eagles as well. I remember seeing my first bald eagle. I was just my heart just soared seeing my first eagle, as it did when I saw my first loon. So loons are going to form pairs. They form pair bonds. They establish a territory on a lake find an ideal place to lay the nest, generally some cover. You know, they lay two eggs, they incubate for roughly 27 to 28 days. And they nest pretty much in an area where they can get into water quickly should the need arise. So they typically will go back to the same nest. If they're successful, they'll repeat that year after year. If they're unsuccessful one year, they may switch. So there's no one set nest that a loon will make. Oftentimes it depends on the environment. They may have simple scrapes. I've seen them lay eggs just right on pebbles and rocks. They might have a raised bowl, which they would build up vegetation along the side. They'll be on floating bogs, cattail bogs. Some nests are open canopy, and then some have cover like the one on the right here. And all, if the loon had its druthers, it would probably want to be on an island because they're away from mammalian predators, let's say like mink, for example. But tips of peninsulas and shorelines, and most of us are fairly familiar with places where loons nest, and I'm sure many of us have seen episodes now where loons are nesting fairly close to boat ramps and seem to habituate themselves to some amount of people traffic and seem to do still fairly well. So, if a loon's gonna build a nest, one place is they're gonna look at is a cross fetch on a lake where if there's large exposure and high waves, it may flood the nest. So typically they're gonna be on the leeward side of that. And they're gonna be adjacent from the winds. And as we discussed here, kind of preferring islands. Uh, one of the things that we talked about with, with the nests as well, is they're generally pretty close to shore where the water is very deep. So they drop off very quickly. And so that's one of the criteria they look at for building a nest is in case they have to get off quickly, is there a steep slope which they can get off on, for example. So the loons, chicks, when they hatch, have semi precocial young. So what does that mean in terms of as an ornithologist classifying that trait? Well, they're born fully feathered, they're fully formed, they have a certain level of motor skills and functions. But unlike a grouse or a killdeer that are born more precocial, they need, they need food, right? They need sustenance. And they probably struggle a little bit with maintaining their body temperature. And so we see them riding on the back of loons, for example. So when the eagles may get a chance to feed on young chicks, that's when they're fairly vulnerable, for example. But we know loon chicks also feed can be prey to predatory fish like pike or trout or bass even, and even snapping turtles. So this is a question that I would pose to the group and maybe we should gather some data on it. Is when I've been doing this, it seems like if a loon chick can get to four weeks old, they're much more likely higher probability to fledge successfully. But in some cases it might even be pushed to six weeks old. So do, eagles, so do eagles prefer more younger chicks? Are they more vulnerable because they have less motor skill development? So maybe they're not as alert, they don't dive as quickly. And I don't know the number, answer to that, but I would be really fascinated to learn that. And so here you can see an older chick, six weeks of age or so, that might be less vulnerable to predation from a bald eagle. So now let's look at some historical and current eagle loon interactions and put a few things in perspective. So there are certainly more eagles today in the 80s and 90s uh, than they were in the 80s and 90s. So more eagles today, right? And 
we're, what we're really wondering about is eagle predation resulting in lower loon numbers, adult numbers and chick numbers. Uh, very valid question. And you'll see that there's probably not a clear answer on that topic. This picture was taken in Washington state. The photographer had already come across this loon that was off the nest and was already being predated by this eagle. So the context of it is unclear. So keep in mind that in the era of DDT from 1945 to the time it was banned in 1972 and I think 1973, New Eagle numbers crashed as did loon numbers. And so in Minnesota, I was able to get some data literally down to 149 nests in 1973. And within almost, you can see 30 year span, it went up 134 fold, literally 1,312 nests. So that's a extraordinary increase in a short amount of time. And that does bring up something interesting is we know eagles and loons have been together for thousands and thousands of years, right? And, I, and so now what we're seeing is it's something different than what we've seen historically, like this high number of eagles, or is this more closely approximated what's been observed historically? So we'll, we'll discuss that. And most of us know the story, the eagles were listed, and then because of their remarkable success, were federally delisted in 2007. So these are some data that I was able to access from the Breeding Bird Survey, and this is from Minnesota. And so on the bottom axis, you're looking at time over 40 years span of time. And the index is just the reliability of seeing a loon. So you might go out to a, a point count, which might be a half a mile, and you listen for three minutes. If you hear or see a loon, you record it. Then you drive another half mile and you do that for 50 miles or 25 miles. And along certain sections in Minnesota, what we're seeing is loon numbers have been up over that 40 year span within that, some of those breeding bird surveys. So loon numbers are up. So if eagle predation was having a large effect on adult loon populations, we probably wouldn't see this increase in adult loons. And this graph is some data from, when we're looking at it, is from Maine. And so I talked to our Maine Audubon group. And then their data goes back from 1983 to 2022. So now we've got 39 years, again, almost 40 years of data. And what you can see, the yellow dots, the squares, are the adult loon population. And you can say they started at 1,500 pairs, and now we're up over 3,000. Or, the, or These are a number of adults, not pairs. So these are the same lakes, the same areas that I surveyed year after year after year. And Minnesota has got a very similar program as this Wisconsin, New York, New Hampshire, a number of states, and even out in Montana, for example, in Washington state. So loon numbers have gone for the most part steadily up. And, and usually to evaluate, is the loon population going up or down? Most population biologists would say, you need to look at three to five years because loon numbers can go up year to year based on, was it a cold spring? Was there a high black fly year? So you had some environmental conditions that might influence the loon numbers. So they feel more comfortable looking at trends in data for three to five years, not just one year they're up, next year they're down. And when they're down, there's a problem. It's like we would wanna look at it over a longer time span. So if we're looking at the bottom line, we're looking at the number of chicks. And you can see oh, probably 250 chicks to, and at the end, it seems to be fairly comparable 40 years later. So again, if eagles were having big numbers and impact on loon chicks, we might not see that. And for those of you who might be less familiar with the state of Maine, we've had the same meteoric rise of eagles in Maine as you have in Minnesota, as we've seen throughout the country. So there's the same kind of eagle impact in this part of the uh, continent as well. So one researcher from Loon Preservation Committee, John Cooley, was kind of looking at this trends in data and was asking, do loons shift their territories if eagles move in? 
So if eagles are new to the territory, have loons moved? And he found that that wasn't the case, that they still remained. And was loon nesting success or chick fledging success lower related to eagle density? And the results were like yes and no. So this is the state of New Hampshire, looking at like over 30 years of data on several hundred lakes. And on some of the really large lakes, where there are lots of eagles and lots of loons, they found no difference. So whether eagle density was up and increased, it did not affect adult success in producing young and fledging young. On some lakes, they did have an impact. So they did have a big impact, uh, on significant impact on chick production. So we're kind of left with that kind of wondering, there's probably not a definitive answer. I think in some situations, potentially there may be some impact, population level impact, and in other cases that wouldn't be the case. So these researchers published the results and came away that possibly eagles are having small but significant effect on loon numbers. <coughs> and this was in New Hampshire during that time span. So during those 15 years. So now this is me offering just some perspective on the situation. So we do know from the fossil record that both eagles and loons have coexisted for literally over a million years. And you would think at some point they would find some equilibrium, some kind of balance in how they respond to each other. So during that time, eagles have probably always taken some adult loons probably not too many because I think loons have such an advantage in the water and their environment. And there has always been some predation on chicks. Uh, I think that has always been the case and that's gonna continue to be. Again, I don't know that eagles specialize in loon chicks, but that's kind of a fascinating discussion to have uh, at another time. And there has probably always been some depredation of eggs. So historically they've coexisted and sometimes we might use the word coevolution, which would be, I hate to think of like the Soviets in the United States nuclear arm race, but if you build nuclear uh, armaments, we will, you'll build more, we build more. And that's kind of like the coevolution co that things are tightly coupled. And so the thinking is that because loons exhibit characteristics that seem to be anti-predatory in response to eagles, they probably in some levels co-evolved. And some measures that loons partake to minimize being predated or attacked by eagles include one, just simply being hyper alert in their presence. And we, many of us have probably witnessed that a loon will ultimately will immediately wail if they see an eagle in its presence. And it seems like there has a certain ringing and message to it because the mate will, will almost immediately respond to the wail of the other mate and they're looking up at the sky, very much aware that there's an eagle in the area. And then there's increased parent chick communication. So the adults communicate to the chicks that there's a threat. You need to be on your lookout. The adults typically will swim closer to the chicks. The chicks seem to be more alert. And so that's evidence for me that there's been some kind of selective pressures by eagles and shaping loon behavior. And then the third point there is just. Loons nest adjacent to a steep drop off. And again, that might be eagle response to eagle predation or maybe another mammalian predator, for example. It may be like a raccoon, they might feel threatened. But the fact that loons nest in steep drop offs probably suggests there's been some selective pressures for that. So, what we're really asking in part is compared to all the threats that breeding loons encounter, how do eagle predation, you stack up against that. And I don't have really strong data. I've got some data that I'm gonna to present to you and then some thoughts that we'll share. So I've looked at multiple mortality papers and reports that have been published or unpublished, which would be in the gray literature. And when you do that, you see that during the breeding season, lead toxicosis seems to be the number one cause of mortality in loons. So how this is gathered is uh, someone comes across a necropsy of a loon, it gets taken to a pathology lab, 
which then determines the cause of death. So you can make a case, there may be some sampling bias, but I wanted to clarify, that's kind of how we make these determinations. And lead toxicosis continues to be probably the leading cause of death and breeding loons. And again, recall it just takes one split shot uh, to be ingested by a loon that gets um, positioned in the gizzard. And that's enough for the lead to leach out and cause death within two to three weeks of an adult loon. Trauma with boats is increasing and varies from five to 30% on the area and the study that was done. But to me, that's probably a little more alarming is I've seen situations as most of us have where loons are fairly habituated to boats and large traffic and seem to be able to maneuver their young and respond. But on the weekend, it seems on many lakes, you get lots of other people, there's more boating traffic. And at that point, a young chick might be vulnerable to a high speed watercraft. So that continues to be a concern. Fishing line entanglement also takes place and if you watch loons long enough, you see fishing line entanglement. I saw it remarkably in the Gulf of Mexico in the winter, and I saw it on this freshwater reservoir in South Carolina in the winter, loons being completely entangled. And if I didn't catch and rescue them and detangle them, they would have drowned. Fungal disease, a condition called aspergillosis takes place. So if a bird has a weakened immune system, it might be vulnerable to a fungal attack, which is more this, 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 can, this disease is, is common in the environment. So this is not something that's invasive or new. And then some loons just in terms of emaciation are thin and gaunt for whatever reason that we know of. And if we look at other stressors in the environment, mercury deposition, elevated places have caused uh, lower reproductive success in some areas. And it usually causes lack of parental attention to loon eggs to incubating. So nest attentiveness is lower. And so then those eggs would be vulnerable to let's say predation by gulls or crows. Acid rain still continues to be a problem in Canada. And then, you know, all of us are aware that climate change is clearly a big driver and a big threat. So not only to loons, but to uh, you know, larger global communities as well. So we can't discount that. So it's difficult to know where eagles fit in this. I would suspect that it's probably lower. <clears throat> in some areas, it might be a little higher, depending on maybe a small lake. And I'll probably address that in the Q&A. So I wanted to share with you some interesting tactics that some people are taking in the state of Washington. So the state of Washington, east of the Cascades, in contrast to West Seattle, for example, there's numerous lakes in the Eastern Washington. And there's been loon enthusiasts, Dan and Ginger Polistrick, who've looked after loons for you know literally over 30 years. And they've seen a rise in eagle predation as well, on some levels on incubating adults and on chicks as well. And so what they tried to do is they find an, a loon nest that doesn't have a canopy. They'll actually you know, canoe over and try to position the trees or branches over the incubating loons to minimize eagles landing on the back or just flying by to try to scare the loon off. So that's been an, inter an interesting tactic. Another one on some of their floating nests, and they have a few, you can see what they've done is they've kind of stacked up brush, you know, four to six feet high to prevent an eagle from flying in and landing on top of the incubating adult or just driving the adult off. And they've had some success with that tactic. And then some of you might be aware of avian guards, which is a great camouflage. And some research is suggesting that eagles are not frightened by this by any means, and we would need to get more data on that. So, but it certainly lowers oversight, depredation by gulls or crows. So the idea is that if you're camouflaged, you're out of sight, out of mind. So this is some tactic that 
re uh, wildlife enthusiasts are trying to implement in certain places. And I wanted to leave this with you as well as fluctuating water levels continue to be a potential problem for nesting loons during the breeding season. If water levels drop too far, the loon nest then is exposed three to 10 feet or more in which to move to get to deep water. So at which part they would be vulnerable to eagle predation. So some of my recommendations, if I had to, I would obviously continue monitoring lakes statewide and all of you who are listening, we, we would need everybody's input to get a handle on this. We, we need to analyze the most recent data that's available and try to reevaluate our position. I think this would be a graduate student project, research project that would be extremely valuable for us as well to get a handle on this. So it certainly warrants our attention. We wanna pay attention to this. And I think the best way to do that is all of you on your lakes, kind of coordinating, communicating with researchers on this situation so we can kind of get a better handle on how loons and eagles are responding to each other. So that's, that's part of what I had for my part of the talk and be happy at this point to entertain some questions. I would say some observations that people have if they wanna share those, I think that would be valuable as well. All right, thank you, Jim. And uh, we'll field questions in just a moment, but uh, just a reminder that you should stay in line with us to the end to see if your name is drawn to win Dr. Peruk's new book, Loon Lessons. They're autographed, by the way, and we will be picking six winners. You have a good chance of winning. Now let's go right to the Q&A portion of today's program. It will be hosted again by Bill Granges, the director of the Itasca County AIS program and a longtime board member with Itasca Waters. Bill? Well, hello and welcome to the Q&A section of today's program. Now, please remember, submit your questions in writing by clicking on the Q&A icon. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of questions here right now, so keep them, keep them coming in. Um, we're not using the chat function, so I'll read the questions out loud, and then they will be answered by Dr. Peruk. Now, we might combine some similar questions. As a matter of fact, I can see there's some similar ones there right now. So we're going to combine the similar questions, and then we may not get to your particular question, but if we don't, please feel free to email us after the end of the program, and we'll get back to you about those unanswered questions. Okay, let's begin. So, Dr. Peruk, our first question is, I once found an adult loon skull below an eagle nest on an island, suggesting the loon may have been brought to the nest and then remains dropped. Can an eagle lift an adult loon and fly with it? Well, that's a fascinating question. And I have not observed that personally. I think the loon is too heavy. So if we think about a bald eagle in terms of its body weight, keep in mind, so female eagles, most raptors are larger than males. So we're looking at in Minnesota, I bet males are probably eight to nine pounds and females are probably 11 or 12 pounds. So this is an adult bald eagle. And loons in Minnesota are smaller than they are in Maine by about 25%. But similarly, I would say, and males loons are larger than female loons by 25%. And so male loons might be nine or 10 pounds and females might be seven or eight pounds. So it's a long-winded way of just kind of looking at pound for pound, eagles weigh as much as loons. It would be very difficult for an adult eagle to be able to carry a loon, you know, even up to its nest. I think that would be almost uh, impossible. And so you wonder if, it, if you found it, was it able to drag it from the water close to the base of the nest and predate it on it? And that would be my guess that's probably may, may have happened. Hmm. Fascinating. Okay, question number two. How much does water clarity have to do with loon nesting and behavior, or is it more about nesting habit and food source? Yeah, to me, I think it's always about food, right? It comes down to food. Loons are going to be where the food are, and loons mm -hmm. are going to be where loons are going to be successful where the food is most accessible. 
and depending on, of course, the food that loons are feeding on. And so in terms of having water bodies with plenty of minnows, mm -hmm. the small fish, that's gonna be ideal. We know loons are adaptable, feeding on crayfish and odonate larvae and other sources to provide food for their young. But I think food is a really big, important aspect of it. And of course, you can't decouple that from water clarity, right? So if the water clarity is poor, loons are gonna have a hard time foraging. It's gonna take them more time foraging and they might have lower reproductive success because they may not be able to provide as much food for one of the two of their chicks. Okay, I see. <laughs> I, I'm just floored by the amount of questions we have coming in here right now. All right, next question. Um, we are seeing more nests being abandoned during incubation periods. Any thoughts on why? Hey, great thoughts of those who shared that question. Thank you for sharing your questions for, and for all of you for sharing your questions. And, and all our observations are useful and meaningful. And you'll find that loon researchers, we don't always have the answer and we have our best guess in situations like this. And as we gather more data, we gain better understanding. So if you're seeing an increase in abandonment, we have noticed Walter Piper did some great work looking at black fly abundance. And as black fly numbers go up or down, depending on how much rain there might be in the spring and temperatures, black fly numbers in high abundance can drive eagle or loons off their nests. So that might be somewhat problematic for that. And it would be interesting to know if that's a persistent trend. What I found is that during the first, you know, seven to 10 days, you know, loon nests are extremely, extremely vulnerable to visitation. And you might, there might be just some nest abandonment that takes place because people are too close to the loons. And so some loons are more sensitive to human disturbance than others. Some will allow you to get close, and I think I always try to caution loon enthusiasts during the first two weeks of incubation to try to give the nest as much space as possible and let the birds feel relaxed. And then once they settle into their incubation patterns and schedules, they tend to stay in the nest until they mm. Mm. It's, it's interesting, you, you mentioned, you touched on black flies. We have two or three questions so far about black flies. I think you, you touched on most of them. Next question, um, we have observed a pair of loons incubating their eggs for over 65 days. Do they realize they will not hatch? Right, and there was, I'm trying to think of the researcher's name in New Hampshire, who first wrote a brief piece about this. His name might come to me in a while. And those of you who are with me in age can relate to try, sometimes trying to find those little facts that they're somewhere there and it's just dusty. So we'll, we'll try to get there. But um, what happens is there's a hormone that's elevated. And when there's pressure up against like the incubation patch, the brood patch, that stimulus tells the loon that there's something still there. Mm. And, and so you can put a softball in place of an egg and the loon will sit on it for 60 days, 70 days. And I have read reports and records of loons staying on nest for literally 60 days as you described. So it's uh -huh. really fascinating. And um, so hopefully that clarifies the, your, your, your question. Yeah, I think you got it. Uh, next question from Anne, do loon nest platforms impact loon eagle interactions? Yeah, and I think that's a great question and one that further research would be useful in determining the impact that eagles and loons, based on those who are using uh, artificial nests or platforms versus natural nests. And that would, I think that would be a great comparison study, great research for a graduate student. Mm. Related question from John, is a natural shoreline nest preferable to placing a man-made man -made floating nest? So the situation is that sometimes mammalian predation and disturbance mm -hmm. can be fairly high along the shoreline. So we're really looking at how much shoreline development is taking place. And I've 
I know personally of situations where dogs from homeowners working the shoreline have chased loons off the nest. Mm. So there, there's a little risk of that that takes place as well. So then you have the converse. You know, should we put out platforms? Well, I'm not an advocate to just put out as many platforms as possible on a lake. In fact, we've seen that there's some detrimental effects. There can be too much aggression between loons and interacting mm. platforms. But on a water body that fluctuates consistently, the, those loons are going to have a more challenging time to raise a family successfully. So I would suggest on fluctuating water bodies you know, that platforms might be a nice potential solution to maintaining loon reproductive success. I know we had a large impact last year here in Atasca County, northern Minnesota, with all the high water uh, that we had from all the rains and, and flooding situations affecting loon populations. Okay, uh, yeah, but, next, yeah. Hey, Bill, hold on your thought. So, and that just brings up again, that's an example. When you're looking at data, we, we just have to be so wary of just one year to the next year mm -hmm. because you have just natural events, high water, flooding, one year compared to the five sure. previous years. And mm -hmm. so we always want to be careful about judging, hey, loon numbers are down this year. Loon chicks are up this year. It's like you, we really need to look at it on a longer time scale to feel more confident that we're detecting a right. real pattern. Understood. And the year previous to that, we had a drought. So yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Um, Steve asks, can too much human disturbance from putting sticks, trees, et cetera, around and above a loon's nest cause the loon to abandon the nest? I would say absolutely, sure. And so would, would I advocate that? Eh, probably not. But uh, I figured I'd share with you what some loon enthusiasts have done with good intentions. I, I, I certainly wouldn't be an advocate of that. And so I, I'll share that with you because I think that's a, a very right. insightful observation. And I would tend to second that. And uh, again, I use that as an example of what somebody might do, like a loon enthusiast might go to some extreme, but I, I would feel less comfortable doing that for sure. Absolutely. Okay, next question is from Karen on beautiful Sissy Backwood Lake. My dad witnessed a jet ski run over a loon mate on a lake and it was killed. The surviving mate mourned the loss of his, her mate with nonstop wailing. Is that typical? Yeah, I've seen one situation that was similar to that where lost the partner and the mate wailed consistently for days. So I would be curious to know how long this took place, but it does show you that there's, you know, an emotional attachment between pair members and they've, they've developed that after year after year, there's a comfort with being with, with a particular partner. And I, I wouldn't be surprised by that interaction. Some of us have seen morning doves and other birds that form mm. partnerships that feel lost. Uh, swans would be another example, losing a partner. And so I think that observation is fairly consistent with what we might expect if you lost a partner, long-term sure. partner. Yeah, yeah, sad. Okay, quick question from Tom. Are there any YouTube sites that monitor nests of loons? Well, I would say, Loon Preservation Committee has a channel that's available. So if you went to LPC, Loon Preservation Committee, and the Adirondack Center for Loon Conservation is also, they basically have a cam, video cam, 24 hours a day. So those are not, nothing's up in the winter right now, but I think both the Loon Preservation Committee in, in New Hampshire and New York have some. And I'm just not as aware, I haven't been back in the Midwest in a while, what might be there in uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota. Well, you got to come back to Minnesota. Yeah, I mean, I'm coming this summer. I will, I'm going to give a bunch of talks in Minnesota this summer. I'm going to be up around Duluth and Ely and Cross Lake for almost the entire month of June. And I'm psyched. I'm really psyched to be there. I want to go kayaking. Uh, I think my friend Sherry Abst might be on watching and looking to spend some time with her. And just to be back in the upper Midwest. I used to do canoe trips in Boundary Waters, you know, 15 sure. years ago. And lovely sure. country. So looking forward to get back there. Well, we have over a thousand lakes here in uh, beautiful Itasca County. Vast majority of them are pristine. Okay, another question here. 
what's the biggest predatory threat to eagles? I live on a lake and I watch golden eagle and I watched the golden eagle chase a bald eagle from our side of the lake across the lake and knock it into the water. Wow, that is awesome. Yeah. I would love to talk to this person and, and, uh, and just do some high fives and just sharing some wonderful emotions. That, that's just a National Geographic observation. And golden eagles are a little more, well, bald eagles might be actually a little more agile than golden eagles, but old, golden eagles are slightly larger. So that's just a fascinating observation. And in terms of predators of bald eagles, I can't think of too many. That's the advantage of being at the top of the food chain, being the largest in the area. And there's not too much overlap in, in the East Coast, maybe in the Midwest, there's a little, and out West, we certainly have more golden eagles than bald eagles uh, in terms of being a threat. Right. But I'm not aware of anything other than maybe a golden eagle to predate actively on a bald eagle. Well, Karen, there's there's your answer. Contact Dr. Peruk. I've truth in advertising. I've I've known Karen for probably 20 years, and she is a phenomenal photographer. On top of this, too, and she lives on uh, beautiful Sissy Beckwith Lake. Okay, next question. Wouldn't this loon eagle relationship be a simple law of ecology? and it's working as intended. Yeah, very fair observation. In, in other words, it's gonna play out, right? These, this dance has been going on for tens of thousands of years. It's gonna balance out. It's probably gonna find some new equilibrium point. And in which case you can make the case, humans can just sit back, relax and watch the show. Mm. And I think that's, 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 a, that's a very possible outcome. Uh, and, and kind of thought process in this. Indeed. Okay, Elizabeth says that she has seen 12 to 15 loons gather together on the water. Is this common? Yeah, I would guess the time of year that she saw that was probably middle to end of July and August. And usually what takes place then is that loons are free to parental responsibilities and there seems to be a need to interact with neighboring loons and so oftentimes you'll see these groups and they're known among loon biologists as social gatherings and these social mm -hmm. gatherings undertake very ritualized behavior so the loons will do line dancing circle swimming interacting with each other i filmed these and some levels uh, for research i can't try to remember how many hours of film i had i think i had almost 100 hours of looking at social gatherings trying to figure out what was going on during them but it is not uncommon to see that during mid to late summer, and these are loons interacting with other loons, getting to know their neighbors, kind of the partnerships. And it's a very fascinating aspect to observe. This is a really good one. Do loons fight back when attacked? Absolutely. So in my book, I discussed some research that Mark Pokris, who's done over 3,000 loon necropsies. And in, the, in there, I discussed Mark's, some of his research that he found that if you look at the breastplate of a loon, so the sternum, that in these necropsies that he did, many of them had these mysterious holes in them. And so he was asking himself, like, what could have caused these holes? Well, he took a loon bill, put it inside and discovered, oh my gosh, it was a perfect fit. Mm -hmm. And so he found that literally about half of the birds had sternal punctures. Now, he concluded they didn't necessarily die from them, but they certainly, and maybe some of them may have been, but they were attacked. And so loons will battle each other. And I, I, I will say this, it has been my observation that there's more loon-loon interactions today than 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and 30 years ago. And I think that's all due because population's been increasing. There's more loons post-DDT era, mm. areas that I know really well that had a, some lakes that had 11 pairs of loons now have 24 pairs of loons. This is like 20 years later. Right. And I thought 11 pairs of loons was saturated on the lake and now there's 24 pairs of loons. And so as you have more loon loon interactions as they're competing for space, we're starting to see more of these contests and these battles ensue. And so that's a really fascinating aspect that it's gonna unfold you know, in the next five, 10 years. This is something so beautiful and so haunting at the same time about loons, their, their, their calls over the lake, especially when it gets darker. You know, I wanna 
Um, that's all we have time for for questions right now. So everyone, thank you for all those fantastic questions. Now, before I give it back to Brian uh, for the drawing of Dr. Brooks new book, Loon Lessons, I'd like to let you know that in addition to these monthly series we have on the first Thursdays, Atasca Waters is again this year offering an opportunity to become an aquatic invasive detector or AIS detector. Now with this course, you'll learn how to identify aquatic invasive species, their native lookalikes, which ARS, AIS are the greatest threat to Minnesota waters, what are best practices for preventing the spread of AIS, how to report native uh, invasive species, relevant rules and regulations, and how to search for AIS on your own. Now, if you have a substantial interest in the waters of Atasca County and would like to learn more, go to ataskawaters.org. Now, there is some self-paced online study that's required for a two-day online course that will be happening on June 13th and 14th from nine to noon. Now, registration opens on April 6th, so we will have more information on that. So ataskawaters.org. Look for more information. Okay then, Brian, let's go back to you. Thank, thanks, Bill. And a big, big thank you to Dr. James Peruk for a fascinating talk. But wait, there's more. Uh, Jim has promised to tell us a couple of good loon stories from his book. So uh, stick around for that. Now let's go to John Downing. John is a founding Atasca Ward, Waters board member and he's director of Minnesota Sea Grant, among other things. John has drawn the names of six lucky attendees of today's program, each of whom wins one of Dr. Peruk's autograph books about loons. John, take it away. Yeah, what a pleasure, Jim. That was just incredibly good and so fun. And the Q&A was really delightful. I'd just like to encourage everybody to, um, if you are not one of the lucky winners, uh, to pick up a copy of Jim's book. Um, it's uh, got aspects of evolution, biology, ecology, courtship, behavior, strange behaviors that many of us uh, have seen them do, their calls, the winter life, and how they're changing in a changing world. It's just fantastically interesting book. It, Jim, it even keeps me awake at reading at night, so that must be really a fun book. So thank you so much for your talk today. And um, Jim's going to tell us, I think we probably only have about time for one story, but Jim can, while uh, Chad Manneke, my colleague, and I do the drawing, could you um, tell us one of your favorite uh, loon observation stories? Sure, John, I, I'd be happy to. And I guess I have about three minutes. And if I'm going, if I go past that, just let me know. I'll be fine. So I'll give you, I'll give you the hook, Jim. <laughs> give, give me the hook. I can live with that. I'm, I'm, I'm used to that. So... I've did a lot of research in the Gulf of Mexico, and I was very fortunate to study loon winter behavior. And we see them on our lakes, we get to know their breeding biology, but I have just been fascinated by loons and what they do in the winter. And I have spent over 15 years studying wintering loons from California, Puget Sound, Louisiana, Gulf of Mexico, Florida, Maine. And it's just been a treat, real joy. So one observation I'll share with you, I'm down in the Gulf of Mexico, off the coast of Louisiana, boating around, looking for loons, trying to do a census. And one of the animals I come across is a bottlenose dolphin. And I started seeing little pods of bottlenose dolphins and it was really fascinating. So as a behavioral biologist, you're gonna spend time watching these dolphins. So I'm watching these dolphins and they're, they're foraging. And what they're doing is they're swimming closer towards shore. There's an island. And they're kind of schooling, pushing schooling fish towards the shore. And the fish are trying to evade getting caught by the dolphins. And so they're moving away to the side. And lo and behold, there's a loon, I observe, following in the wake of the dolphin. And it is picking up the fish that is being, trying to evade getting caught by the dolphin. And to me, that interspecies interaction was just fascinating. And we see a cetacean, a bio, a whale, like a, do, a member of the whale family, a dolphin. And in that position, here's a wintering loon that's kind of getting food that's trying to evade getting captured by a bottlenose dolphin. So that remains one of my most intriguing observations is just watching this loon feed on fish that's trying to evade getting caught by a bottlenose dolphin. 
Oh, thanks. That that's so cool. The, your story, the stories you have in your book are fantastic too. It's uh, really really remarkable. And I think we're out of time. And up on the screen, I think Chad's already got our winners. Um, and those of you who were whose names were drawn, um, we will be in touch with you, looking for your addresses, so we can ship out the book from here from Minnesota Sea Grant. And I I'd like to. Add my thanks to Jim uh, for agreeing to be with us and remind you all that, hey, watch out for the talks Jim's going to be giving uh, next June and uh, uh, and uh, it should be really fast, really fascinating. Um, so I guess it's up to me now to turn it back over to Brian Whittemore uh, for the outro and um, about thank you so much, Jim, for being with us. Sure thing. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, guys. That was great. I want more stories though. If you would like to watch the program again or recommend it to your friends and neighbors, a recording of today's talk will soon be on our website at tabascawaters.org. And a link to our survey is on your screen. Also, you will be getting an email evaluation form from us, Tabasco Waters, so you can choose how you'd like to respond. And we'd really appreciate your feedback. Our next program will be on March the 2nd when Dr. Gregory Sass will talk about fisheries habitat. I'm Brian Whittemore. Thanks so much for being with us today.